on teaching civil liberties government. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for introduction, uh, introduction, Gus. It's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, I think this is an important subject because um, the more we can get into the uh, the, the minds and uh, of the people who really control and influence our lives, uh, in terms of military leaders, governmental leaders, and help them understand uh, the importance of privacy and civil liberties, uh, and, and inform their calculus when they make decisions, I, I think we all win. So that's what this talk is about, a little about uh, some of the tools available. If you had the opportunity, and there are opportunities out there, to help teach people uh, uh, inside those communities, what would you teach them? <laughs> Pardon me, the notes, it, got, it turned into night pretty quickly. Um, and we'll also talk about the, uh, the tools that are available for doing that. So I have to add the mandatory disclaimer, and uh, I, one, I understand no one reads them, but I'm here as a free citizen, um, and these are opinions are my own, not that of my employer. Uh, and personally, I, I, I think nothing better evokes faceless bureaucracy than that of uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall, the scene from it. Uh, so uh, this is my third time speaking at Hope. The first time was on malicious interfaces, how uh, interfaces, uh, particularly on the web, are designed not to help us, but to actually trick us and harm us in a variety of ways. Uh, last Hope we did, uh, at Hope 9, uh, Lisa Shea and I came down from West Point and gave a talk on countermeasures against surveillance. So I think that was a timely subject. And then we, were, uh, then we were asked this year to come back and talk about some of the things that we've been doing inside and where it could go, how it could scale up in terms of teaching uh, inside the, the military, the governments, really around the world. A key aspect of this, I think, is your personal uh, awakening to the importance of privacy and civil liberties. So there's some people in the room uh, probably haven't uh, you know, gone too far down that path, but there are others, and I'd ask you to think about this. What, what was the event? What was the series of events? Was it a friend who helped educate you? Was it your own personal just reading the news and suspicion that something's going on? But what, what transformed you? What uh, raised your awareness, the importance of privacy and civil liberties to the point that you want to sit uh, uh, in this room and, and learn more, you want to, actually more than that, just sit in a room, you want to go out there and make a difference. For me, I can point to largely DEF CON 9, which was about 13 years ago. I went there, and I think I had kind of this innate kind of libertarian worldview, but I went there and I realized that, you know, why are they passing this hat around for the EFF, right? Who is this EFF? And I look and go, oh, gosh, that all makes sense when I, when I took a look at what they were talking about. And, and I started paying attention and grew from there to the point where I, you know, really, it transformed me personally where I, I took this on as a, really as a, as a cause and a research area and a, you know, advocacy area to try and get out there and make a difference. So that in the last 13 years, let's see, have done a lot of work in this space trying to go out and make a difference. And this all is, is available online for those that are interested. And I think it's important because each of us, it, the more you embrace this, the more you want to make a difference. And f having advocates that try and make a difference both inside the system and outside the system is, is very important. And particularly inside the system, you're part of that tribe and you can, uh, you know how that tribe thinks, you know how to communicate these ideas and principles in a way that might be more effective than just trying to do it from the outside in. So some framing questions, because the answer to this isn't necessarily evident to some people, right? Um, I would argue yes, it is possible, but if we're not careful, we can destroy it. And helping, when, when we're making decisions, we have to have people that are thinking about uh, both sides of the various aspects of this so do we don't destroy the, the dem democracy in, in an attempt to protect it. And we'll get back to this at the end, but I wanted to just kind of uh, list it up front. If you had the uh, access to people, uh, senior leaders, mid-career leaders, junior people in the government or the military, what would you teach them? And we'll talk a little bit of you know, my perspective on their perspective, kind of how, they, how what's a common view of the world. Um, but at the end, we're gonna, I hope to go to Q&A and then have a bit of discussion on um, ideas that you might have 
toward this end. Ultimately, I think the objective would be helping uh, encourage people to have this mental model, this mental framework to take privacy and civil liberties into account when making decisions, often security decisions because of the tension between uh, security and privacy. And it can't be out of a sense of compliance, you know, compliance, like we have to do this thing. That never works well, and people generally do the minimum standard, um, but from a true appreciation where they get it. Because a lot of decisions for a variety of reasons, either time, right, their decisions need to, be, need to be made very quickly, or because of classification or other forms of sensitivity, a lot of decisions aren't transparent they're, or, or they're made uh, in rooms that we'll never have access to. But it, the more that these ideas permeate various uh, decision makers, uh, you've heard this, uh, probably the phrase, when, when security decisions are being made, it's good to have a hacker in the room. And I agree, because I've been in rooms where there wasn't one, or it was just me, and people who really don't know how the internet worked were making very important decisions about it. So the more that we can have uh, uh, people who are informed, the more likely they will be in the room. And I also think there's a trend, I mean, in the community, uh, in this community, it, it's been this, this movement, this, you know, the, the hacking renaissance that we're in now has, Early on, it was a bunch of young people, arguably, right? I mean, there was a lot of young people, and there was, you know, obviously uh, more senior folks, people as well. But that generation is now rising to prominence where they're C-level executives and corporations. They're colonels in the army. They're various, they're in positions where they can influence things now and also groom the, the next generation coming up. So um, I, I think that gives hope for the future. Now, I've, I gave a whole talk on this at DEF CON about the instrumented world that we're, uh, increasingly instrumented world that we're living in. And I've boiled it down to one slide because it's uh, a bit like preaching to the choir here. But I, th I think it's common knowledge that more and more sensors, more and more aspects of our daily life are being um, surveilled upon. Sometimes with our willingness, you know, we have a fitness wristband that tracks our uh, our day-to-day -day activity. but every aspect, and increasingly so, and it's, it's not showing any signs of slowing down. If anything, it's speeding up from satellites in space to uh, red light cameras to license plate readers. Um, and it was once moderated, these type activities were once moderated by um, the human workload required. Well, that's going away with ubiquitous network sensing, and that's why this is important. <clears throat> we are living in a historic time. If you'd asked me two years ago, um, I would have told you, you know, that the uh, attention span of the general public uh, was about, they didn't largely care about privacy or security. And events, um, although significant, like the AOL search query disclosure of uh, 2006 or WikiLeaks, uh, those got people's attention for a period of time, but then they kind of faded. They're well known in, the, in, in this community, but uh, they faded rapidly. But now we're really in a historic time where uh, we have uh, everyone's attention. When you think of your parents, they're probably talking, or parents or grandparents, and they're talking to you about privacy, <laughs> uh, you'll, you know that something has changed. And I don't know when it'll end, but we're in a unique point in history where we have everyone's attention, and that's a good point to maybe push for progress. <clears throat> A key aspect of this is understanding different perspectives. If you're trying to teach, say, law enforcement or military, they, they tend to view the world in terms of security. That's their job. That's what they do. They're the guard dog that wants to, you know, wants to protect. You have advocacy groups such as the EFF or advocates in general that are very much aware of the activities going on that the average person is, is unaware of. Uh, and also they understand the legal uh, framework, uh, the legal challenges that are in play. Policymakers are, are busy people and they're fighting in a, they're working in a large uh, governmental systems often uh, amidst checks and balances that prevent rapid change. Uh, from my experience, and I haven't had too much engagement with senior policymakers, but I have met some 
and the ones I found that, despite what I, what you kind of get the sense from on the press, from the the press, is that they're actually trying to do a good job. They have limited ability to to do it, but they were actively listening and trying to figure out ways ahead. They like solutions that are actionable, something they can they can do, not just kind of like soft, you know, general uh, ideas. They want something that they can turn into a decision. Industry in general, we're drawing broad generalities here. Uh, very much concerned about the uh, the bottom line and, uh, and and how does this impact uh, you know the 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 revenue coming into the company uh, the reputation of the company legal compliance and then your average citizen which I would who I would argue just go about their day-to-day -day lives uh, conducting business and rarely do they think of privacy although now I think it's it's on their radar I want to dig down a little deeply because we're, we're th talking specifically about training or educating government or the military, uh, governments or militaries. And again, these are just broad swath generalizations in my personal opinion, but I, I think they, they're on, on track. Uh, there's a, a, a common sense of patriotism uh, amongst these communities to be called a patriot is, is a, a high compliment. They're, they're very much aware of the threat threat because uh, they classified information, top secret feeds, they're seeing, uh, abuse, uh, they're seeing the badness that is in the world on a day-to-day -day basis and things that um, usually do not make the press. <clears throat> they're very focused on trying to stop bad things from happening again. So this is that security focus, right? This is largely security, security, security. They have an inability to speak because uh, once you get access to a clearance, you sign a non-disclosure agreement and rarely will, uh, are, are they allowed to speak out loud and there's been posters, posters out there and, and it's rigid, frankly rigid enforcement to, to enact this. And this is key. Uh, I, I sense that this general trust that what what is being built won't be abused. And when I say what is being built, you can think about various security systems, large and small. Uh, there's a, a trust out there that it, it won't be abused. And some would argue that that could be a naive trust. Um, oh, and just so you know what this picture is. And when you do repelling, this is kind of a, you know, in, in industry, when they have the fall backward and your coworker will catch you, uh, the military equivalent is in repelling. Uh, the person on the ground is the belay man. So you're supposed to let go of the rope and fall. And the belay man, if they pull on the rope, you'll stop. If you don't, you'll hit the ground. So that's what, uh, what's going on here is a trust exercise. They also feel uh, a, that their hands are tied because they don't have the information they need to protect. Um, and, and I think this is a, a, a great quote. Their hands are tied by legal authorities. Uh, and I'll just read it you know, because this is, uh, may hit an MP3 one day. If DOD defended the land domain in the same manner as cyberspace, a Russian land invasion of New Jersey would have to be fought by U.S. citizens and commercial entities with whatever weapons they possess. DOD would only defend Fort Monmouth and Fort Dix. Um, so that is... Uh, that is kind of the, I'm, what I'm trying to do is expose you to the mindset of the, tip, uh, of the audience, the students, what they might be. And again, this overarching desire to protect. And that straining at the leash of authorities, like I want to protect more, I want to protect more. And the leash would be the legal authorities. So if you're trying to educate that population, how far, how fast down the rabbit hole can you take them, right? How do you, how do you get into, the, given that, and I think that what I just painted was, is reasonably accurate, uh, how far, how fast down the rabbit hole do you take them and what, what do you teach them how, and, and when? And this is, uh, this is obviously not scientifically generated, but and, and in that population of people that you're trying to teach, there'll be some that never get it. That, that is pretty scientific. <laughs> It's science, okay, I, I've just, uh, and even if I, and, and we'll get at this later, even if I had the ability to survey people and come up with the scientifically generated uh, results here, um, it would probably be very embarrassing and, and would shut them up, they'd never do it again. Part of this, and, and maybe a, a strategy to help 
uh, frame what the, frame people's thinking would be to get them in terms of the thinking in terms of security and privacy. And I, I like this. Uh, well, we put together this model where you've got two axes, security, uh, two continuums, a security continuum and a privacy continuum, where security can be, uh, a security solution could be detrimental, uh, ineffective, or effective. So you've got that axis. And then on the other side, you have um, a privacy solution could be invasive, neutral, or uh, beneficial to privacy. And then from there, you can kind of bu uh, bucket things into quadrants the first quadrant accomplishes neither privacy or security, and I would think uh, in terms of security theater, right? You get to spend, you spend a lot of money, and it makes privacy, and, and it makes you less secure, and costs uh, money, and threatens privacy. So that tends to be security theater, a la Bruce Schneier. Then you have solutions that are uh, accomplish security objectives, uh, but reduce privacy in the process, and. If you're not thinking about privacy as being an axis, if you just take off the privacy axis altogether because you don't think about it, it's not part of your decision making, this is where you could likely end up. Then you have solutions that uh, are detrimental to security, and, uh, but be beneficial for privacy. And we see those all the time in terms of countermeasures. And then ultimately you have solutions in the bottom right quadrant that increase security and increase privacy. For example, maybe a code audit of um, you know, major so a, a transparent code audit of major software that people use. And helping push people to try and seek solutions closer to quadrant four may be one acceptable way that uh, you can help get these people to start thinking in terms of it, because I don't think they consider the privacy access very much, if at all. <clears throat> so to give you a few successes, and I won't claim that the, any one of these has changed the world, but I see them as building blocks, right? <laughs> that th these are significant and y y you can build upon them. One, as Gus mentioned, that we were able to get Little Brother into flagship training course of a major uh, government organization and over 600 uh, mid-career and senior people have had a chance to read it. And it wasn't just read it, there was also discussion afterwards, a framed discussion with, with structured discussion questions about uh, the importance of privacy and civil liberties to democracy. So we were able, uh, able to make that happen. And the organization was supportive of, of including it. Uh, we had a, in 2012, uh, and again, this is like, shows you, what I'm trying to paint is inside the system, how you can make brick by brick, you can, you can help facilitate change. At West Point in 2012, they had a senior conference and they brought in uh, the sitting director of NSA, US Cyber Command, two former directors of NSA, was able to get a panel on uh, privacy and civil liberties as part of the discussion. And there was about 50 senior leaders in the room, not just military, but leaders from industry and, and government, and able to get on the panel, uh, Marsha Hoffman and Jeff Moss, sitting on the panel with a former director of the NSA. I think that's very cool. And to, to have that type of, uh, of debate in front of an audience of people who are really empowered to make a difference. Uh, West Point just hired a, um, uh, ethics fellow that's going to be focused on privacy and civil liberties. Again, I think it's the first of its kind. Um, St Stephanie's in the audience sitting there in the dark. Uh, but uh, again, I, it's, I think it's very exciting and a positive move, uh, move forward. So she's going to be focusing on this area uh, specifically. We've had, we have a, a formed a privacy research group now and it's about its fourth year. Uh, because I found that there are actually, you know, despite what you might think, there's a good number of people who are interested in this and wanted to uh, help make a difference. So reeled them in. And a lot of those publications and talks and things that I showed you in the beginning, next to the DEF CON badge, were uh, came uh, not just my individual work, but by creating a team of people who are interested. Uh, I think this is the only privacy research group uh, in DOD, and I think the government, but uh, I, if anyone knows differently, I'd be interested. Again, I think it's positive. Okay, so those are building blocks, right? What, what could end progress? You, we know how the world works, right? If you insert the wrong embarrassing headline here on the front page of the New York Times, thing, people will, will back off immediately and, and will shut down. So you have to do this at a pace and in a way that, that we just have to operate in the constraints of the system that we're in. 
Okay, so let's look a little bit at solutions. When you're dealing with organizations of 100,000 to a million people or more, the tools available are crude, right? You, you know, think, if you're, in charge, if you're CEO of a large company, how do you shift it? If you're the in charge of a general in charge of an army, how do you change how the private views the world? You can't do it personally. Things are indirect. So I have a list of, of tools here, but these are tools that could be, uh, could be employed to varying degrees and varying degrees of effectiveness. So I'll go through some. Uh, the government's known for cheesy posters uh, that, that no one, this is real, this is real, I've seen this, uh, I've seen this. Um, this is where the, uh, the hacker community uh, has great artists uh, and night and, day, night and day difference from what we see. But I, you could see you know, perhaps a collaboration of, with you know, New York City Art School uh, to, to create sets of posters that people want, right? And don't want just because uh, they're, they're so cheesy, they, it's, it's appealing. And I, although I don't know about the ultimate effect of, po uh, of posters, if you see this over your office copier, you're like, oh, okay, I will, I will terminate poor security practices. Absolutely. Uh, pamphlets. Uh, well, tech, uh, again, you know, these are tools, these are things people do. Uh, I like this one. While technically not a pamphlet, it, it is pamphlet-like, uh, and it's one of my personal favorites. Uh, it was Communities Against Terror Terrorism, uh, FBI, and Bureau of uh, Justice Assistance uh, document, uh, potential indicator of terrorist activities related to an internet cafe. And uh, I, th I thought it was funny that if you're overly concerned about privacy, paying cash, use an anonymizer or encryption, and you download information about electronics, uh, that you could be um, you know, considered uh, someone to watch out as being a terrorist. But nonetheless, pamphlets are a tool. Uh, professional reading lists. The, these are, there's actually a lot of professional reading that occurs within the military. Senior leaders publish lists. Getting a book, uh, getting the right book out there. And these are actually quite thoughtful. They'll have discussion questions and groups around the military will use these to, uh, to form discussions like a monthly, uh, read a book a month and then bring everybody in and have a discussion. So I think that it would be possible to, to uh, get something appropriate here. Conferences uh, can be a tool like this. You bring a bunch of like-minded people together. Uh, they've gotten much harder to organize of late, uh, as, indi as indicated by the uh, uh, NBC Nightly News and the woman dancing uh, with the dollar sign uh, bedazzled medallion around her neck. Uh, so conferences are harder, but they're also a tool. And there's this this thing in the, ar well, in the army, in the, in the military, called mandatory annual training. And again, this is kind of more of a compliance mode. You have to, you have, to have a certain amount of training every year, either in the classroom, some of it's computer-based, uh, but it's real and it gets out there. I don't think including uh, privacy and civil liberty, the importance of privacy and civil liberties will not come from, from this type of training. Okay, so I, I have um, just a couple of examples. And to be fair, uh, I've chosen these because they're the absolute worst example I could find uh, in, in terms of training, uh, but the most humorous example I could find. Uh, so there, one idea came from, you want to turn your computer on we, and use it. Before you can use it, you have to answer a question on a given subject, all right? Okay, uh, it, would, it would frustrate me, but it, it might be when you're trying to educate 100,000 people all at the same time. All right, so let's take a look at this one. And I've, if you see the gray boxes, uh, I've anonymized the logos that were all over this system. Okay, and here it is. This is part of workplace violence training. Would slamming a sandwich uh, in the garbage can in anger be an indicator for workplace violence? Right? So, I don't know, ask yourself. The world wants to know. Ah, no, the answer is no. It means he or she had a bad sandwich. <laughs> so thankfully my friends worldwide send me these that, and then I can, I can use them in talks. Uh, and, and again, I, there's actually a lot better. This is the worst one I could find. So this is an outlier and another. Okay, this is computer-based training. And 
this is part of the mandatory uh, protect classified information, uh, protect uh, pri uh, uh, personally identifiable information computer-based training, uh, presumably built by a con contractor. And this is the protecting classified information scavenger hunt. Right, so we'll, we'll get to the, 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 the details of the scavenger hunt in a question, but you see various things on the desk, like the, the open safe and the folder with five inch high letters that say PII and the fax with a secret cover sheet on it. Okay, they give you clues. Maybe used to talk to people in different locations. Now don't shout out the answer if you get it. All right, all right, so you can think again. Clue one, used to talk to people. It must be plugged in. Again, clue two. Finally, and the ringer. <laughs> it rings when other people contact you. So at this point, I'm about ready to slip my wrists uh, because this is about four hours of training uh, <laughs> and that you can't just click next on. And there's no way to just take the test. You have to go, th go through this. Uh, Okay, and let's get to the final screen. Okay, and I added the arrow in case anyone was wondering. Uh, you, the answer was, you use your desk telephone to talk to people in different locations, and it rings when people use it to contact you. Unlike your mobile telephone, it must be plugged in when in use. Okay, so uh, again, I don't know that computer-based training is the right answer here. And, and if you'll forgive me, I think this is somewhat relevant to the and it's also part of my personal therapy to, for my sanity <laughs> to just share this with you. Uh, the military actually, the military and civilian uh, organizations have robust civilian leader development, or military and civilian leader development programs. Years of education. In, in, as, as an officer in the army, you'll have three years of classroom experience, formal, like away from everything classroom experience in, in, in 20, uh, if not picking up a master's degree or, or other things along the way, and then myriad other things plugged in. And the same thing on the civilian side. So but getting into that, getting into lesson objectives or lessons in, in those programs has potential. And again, that's the type of momentum you can help build. If you start getting an increased degree of people who understand the importance of this, they can start embedding this. And there's a great deal of professional writing that occurs. Ultimately, though, uh, it, it takes senior leader support. If you go in with this idea like, hey, let's do this thing, uh, you need to win over the senior leaders and, and have them help champion it. So targeting senior leaders in some way uh, it would probably be very optimal. And uh, an upcoming opportunity, and what we're hoping to do is apply what we get uh, comes out of the discussion today, is this is National Defense Uni University. It's down in D.C. We're going to be bringing in about 200 military senior leaders for um, basically a one day one day event where people will be providing talks. And Stephanie's going to give a talk there on uh, the importance of privacy, privacy and civil liberties. So what we're trying to do is is get feedback uh, from you all for uh, ideas there. And then I won't go in, into all of these, but I, I think that there are uh, strategies and, and kind of things we need to keep in mind when, when trying to train and educate people from, from these type of communities. Uh, we want to win them over in terms of, of their worldview, not out of a sense of compliance, and, and understand that there's a limited rate of change. Uh, I think ultimately a good starting point would be coming out of mu mutual respect so like not just dismissing a hand, but out of mutual respect. And the, the message comes best if you have an ally inside that community working from inside because they've got street cred there rather than trying to come in. And if, you, if you're trying to come in and you don't have kind of uh, excessive background in that, you can at least work with people who do to help calibrate you. Uh, that uh, it doesn't just need to be senior leaders, it can also be at the grassroots level. And I tend to, th I, I believe that research is an enabler because it gives the tools, uh, it helps provide tools to people to uh, incorporate in their classrooms. All right, so I, this is just a, a straw man concept of uh, uh, content I, what I, I put together. This is, again, just, just a light sketch that hopefully when we go to Q&A, uh, we can kind of get you, get you thinking. But I think you have to convey uh, the why, who cares, and so what aspects to this to the audience. Why, how does this, because you're, you're thinking security, 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 why do I need to worry about this other thing? And I think there's great uh, examples from history about privacy and civil liberties in general, and certainly the, those of abuses in the past.
that, uh, that could be conveyed. Uh, how this ties to the law and uh, in terms of ideology and, and kind of philosophy, as well as a, a representative uh, cases or something that could highlight particular aspects. Tying it to the, the challenge of the instrumented world is another, and maybe with some motivating examples that, aren't, that are probably common knowledge in this community, but not common knowledge for the, uh, the average military or government person, such as uh, EFF's work on micro dots, on, you know, micro dot serial numbers coming out on, uh, on printed documents out of certain printers. Uh, that the US Postal Service, it was reported in the news, uh, scans the outside of every envelope and package to create a database of, of every message that's, that's sent, even through the paper mail. And then getting people thinking about what the future portends. Uh, and, and then conveying other concepts, such as that, that understanding the perspective of the citizen that you're trying to protect is equally important to democracy. And that you can't always be sure that your uh, worldview is right. You need to be open to new ideas. That engaging the population is important. And that freedom of thought, freedom of our expression, really are fundamental tenets of our democracy. If you destroy those, you risk destroying our democracy. Okay, so to, to wrap. This isn't, an, there are no overnight solutions. I think we're building this brick by brick, but at the same time, we're in a historic era where a lot of uh, people will be more open-minded to these discussions, uh, perhaps, than they were in the past. Uh, progress can be fragile, like I said, front page of the New York Times. It requires engagement on, both sides have to try, all sides have to try, right? I'm trying to work on the, the military and government side. And, not just to reach into the military, but it's the policymakers ultimately that control our fate. Okay, so I was hoping to, uh, is it possible to raise the lights? Okay. Uh, but these are the questions that I hope to maybe, uh, during Q&A, which we're about to go to, if, if you want to comment on anything, or to uh, you know, bring up some point associated with this. You know, when, you know, how, did your, uh, how have you seen an awakening occur in yourself or others? Uh, what would you teach people? What strategies or techniques would you recommend? Uh, other sources of content uh, and ideas, because this is the internet era that we live in, and I rec recognize there's tremendous resources out there. And you know, any other ideas you might want to share? So with that, if we can go to Q&A, I'll be um, happy to um, take questions and hopefully get a little discussion going. Yeah, hi. Um, re regarding your outreach to the military, um, as you start thinking about their experience and the things they're trying to do, and it sounds like you have a pretty good understanding of it already, uh, one of the th things that sometimes works is they have a wonderful historical sense. I mean, they read history all the time. And so uh, there's also the idea of fighting the last war. So um, you had a little note about examples of abusive, previous abusive governments. Uh, maybe indirectly, you should also work on the metaphor of uh, us turning into the people we beat, because mm. that's a well-known metaphor. Um, you know, like, we didn't fight the Cold War to create a police state here, for example. And, and that would really resonate. And the other thing is they're not going to be as liberal as, you know, perhaps this audience. So um, some of the things which, again, indirectly you can reach out to where you would say, oh, those idiot right-wingers are upset about this or that, whether it be IRS or whatever. Those kind of metaphors will also resonate. Um, and try to do it fairly so that no one thinks that you're saying well, you know, let's make believe that we're, um, we're all going to be over on this side of the spectrum now. I mean, the fact that they do this, I mean, there is a Southern military tradition, so that's what, you know, those kind of people have kept us alive. Thank okay, you. Very good. Thank you. Okay, sir. Yep. So, um, one of the things that's disturbing to me about the current situation is the 
appearance of our moving towards a permanently militarized society, which is approaching sort of banana republic status with the uh, security money that's going into local police departments and the uh, militarization of local police uh, increasingly putting us in a situation that looks like a banana republic. Uh, you can't uh, have dissent when the police are much more effective at kettling the protesters and will lock them up for three days and then let them out, et cetera, et cetera. The tactics that have been uh, pioneered so effectively here in, the United, in New York, uh, and the Republican National Convention and, and uh, the Occupy Wall Street demonstrations. So that relies on the recruitment of um, uh, entry-level folks who are coming primarily from low-income communities now. The, um, the, the citizen army uh, doesn't, is, is rapidly falling away, uh, and you're seeing recruitment from, uh, a, as a, a way for low-income kids to um, get education, uh, to have a secure job, uh, and to uh, get out of the ghetto or, or whatever uh, uh, conditions they're in. Uh, the danger of that is that you create a caste system where we now have a uh, military slash police caste that's permanent and that's invested in the continued um, oppression of everybody else for the interests of the elite. Um, it's very uh, hopeful to me to hear your talk that the upper echelons of the military, as you're experiencing, do not see the world that way, uh, or don't seem to from, from your description. And I think that's uh, a good thing. Um, but fundamentally, what, m what might be something we need to address is a kind of psychological difference between the folks who are here, for the most part, and the folks in the military and that is one's relationship to authority. <laughs> it's a psychological difference is extremely powerful and that really um, seems to sometimes separate the sheep from the goats. Uh, and um, it's hard to be on the same side or to form alliances with people who are very different from you about that fundamental psychological issue. So I, I'm not sure where that goes in terms of comment from your part, but those are the concerns that I bring. And I teach um, college students at, at City College here, which because it's New York City and City College are uh, very uh, ethnically diverse and uh, tend to be sort of low income relative to Columbia. Uh, so uh, those are folks I would like to be able to influence. So this is, it's very relevant to me here. I think you, you bring some important points up. The, uh, the idea of recruiting. Right. I mean, the the military is composed of people recruited from the population. So the pipeline of people in the more so this isn't just an issue inside the government governments or militaries. It's, it's an issue in the population. That the more you can influence the population coming in, uh, the more you, you, training you world do you get change you get for free in many ways if you can if you can touch that. Um, there's, there's also a concern generally in the military of this increased separation between the military and the population which it serves, right, and that, and, and the, that gap, and that you, they live in isolated pockets and military bases with guards around them, and sometimes you can spend days or months living on base before you even get out. So uh, that's, that's a concern. It's a, it's a, known, it's a known problem, uh, and, you know, getting out there and, you know, in the real world <laughs> is important. So, uh, and in the idea of, of variety of views, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it's nirvana, and, but I think that people, it's that security mindset. You have to get past that they're thinking, really they're laser focused on security, 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 and to help them kind of broaden their perspective so it can be done. But all very good points, sir, thank you. Okay, sir. Um, hi, uh, so to answer one of your questions on the board, um, I come from the UK. My awakening occurred when, when I was relatively young, our government passed draconian laws that said you hand over your encryption keys or you end up in jail forever, period. There's no end to when we can you know, decide to uh, let you out. Um, and that, that to me, I, you know, from my history class, I knew that wasn't a good thing, that you know, our government had started taking bad steps. 
Um, but if I may be so bold to ask you a question, you've clearly sure. got this um, fantastic position within a very hierarchical organization to help educate your uh, leaders in privacy. Um, I work in the UK government, and I'm curious as to how you got into that sort of role within that type of organization, um, how you created that space for yourself. So uh, there are various pockets in the military, and I was able to steer toward West Point, which is uh, an educational institution. So they, uh, it's an undergraduate school, the academic departments, they support academic freedom, right, which is important because okay. it's really, and you're encouraged to publish and to go out and, and do things. And, and unless you're disclosing classified information or obvious, or giving away you know, sources and methods or things like that, you have a, a very wide lane in which to, to work. And I've enjoyed, uh, I've pushed the limits of that lane, <laughs> uh, but uh, you can get a lot done with academic freedom. And and I yeah so I, I think and, the, and hence the others I mean there are others there that we kind of gravitated toward toward that that pocket as a place that we could think more freely. Okay, thank and you kindly. I, I'd also add that largely until the birth of things like Cyber Command and an Army Cyber Command that largely they weren't really even aware this community existed. <laughs> as much as you know, like the military just focused on military things, they weren't really thinking in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, they are starting to pay attention more now. So. Okay. Thanks again. Which could be good or bad for me. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm a human rights humanitarian researcher, and I just want to bring a couple of inter international perspectives that um, in, in the post-9-11 world and looking at the world as a battlefield, the global war on terror, quote, unquote, <laughs> right? Uh, and under the 3D approach of diplomacy, defense, and development for international development, if there are any civil society folks in the room, uh, we can't. It's not enough to just talk about um, working with government and military. That's already a huge ball of wax that will keep lots of folks employed for the rest of their lives. I'm sure you will have no dearth of work in this line. Um, sorry. Um, my concern is around how can I distill this? The oxymoronic uh, phrase humanitarian militarism. Mm, okay. <laughs> no, I'm actually talking about, um, you know, maybe, maybe some folks read an article a month or so ago, I think it was in The Nation, on uh, something which most Americans have no clue about, which is the largest drone base in the world, largest um, military base, largest U.S. military point of operation in Djibouti, and the massive expansion of U.S. military um, in Africa. Most of my work has been in Sub-Saharan Africa, not only though. Um, and my concern is not just uh, the maneuvering of U.S. military in the world and its interactions with local populations on quote-unquote humanitarian grounds, which, I, which is a very debatable concept. Um, I'm concerned with technology and information ethics, right to privacy, and the ways in which data is the new oil, data is the new conflict resource, Populations, segments of populations, for example, Horn of Africa, are being targeted on the basis of co-opting of data, capturing data via backdoor channels. A lot of it happens by subcontractors. Military is working a lot through subcontractors, as are international development organizations. U.S. aid works through subcontractors. How can we work on the right to privacy, responsible data practices, not only with government and military, not just with USAID and US military, but with all of the subcontractors, the private security and defense contractors, the NGOs that USAID funds. So this is, this is, this is a, It's you know, a non-trivial problem. I, I recognize that, but I'm raising it. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are, so there are tools, right, to, so, sorry, just a sure. quick thing. So, so one of the ways in which I'm personally addressing this is by working um, as an early adopter of crypto tools and secure communications, et cetera, and trying to work with my fellow humanitarian researchers um, to also adopt and start to use secure communications and encrypt files and hard drives and these kinds of things. Um, so, for example, I'm working on developing a, a crypto party for humanitarian researchers who do things that I do. Yes. So. Well. Yeah, I, I think ultimately, I mean, the way the way the, the giant bureaucracy works <laughs> is contractors are responsive to the, the to the the types of opportunities that are out there and how the contracts are written. Mm -hmm. If the people that are funding the contracts care, uh, the the you'll see contractors caring more and subcontractors. So and it can literally. 
So, I mean, that's the tool. That's how they respond. It's via the contract right. or the culture. And if they think that there's some beneficial, something beneficial for them in terms of reputation or in terms of getting the contract or money, then those are, I have to think about it some more, but off the cuff. Very good point, so thank you. Sir. <laughs> Sir. Um, so I have a question for you, which is, um, well, let me give you a little background. Hopefully I can phrase this correctly. We're really good at, at negative reinforcement. When we see uh, abuses, when we see things that are done incorrectly, we shine a spotlight on it. Um, you know, there's no, no lack of that in the media right now for um, concerns as to how the government's acting, behaving, et cetera, et cetera. Rarely do we see positive parts, but when we do, like you are this little bastion of light in a place that we normally, you know, try to negatively reinforce and say bad government. What can we do since we aren't in the chain of command and we can't promote you that actually help with a positive reinforcement for the small good things that we see? So this is a very fair question. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, and, and this doesn't answer your question, is that uh, an organization I work for, they use the motto, informal motto, absence of criticism is praise. <laughs> uh, they even had it translated into uh, Latin. To Latin. <laughs> yes. um, the, the military is responsive to civilian oversight very much so. It's built into the DNA from day one that the military is responsive to the civilian authority. So do we, do we write so our civilian, senators civilian, with positive things? Civilian authority is, uh, uh, is probably a, a tool to do that. I, I don't know. Well, you have some experience in this area. Maybe a little. Uh, and <laughs> my, my take would be those that, the, that you look up the food chain and, and those people can influence things. Call much. them, write them, as as citizens. When we see something good, finally, how, how do how do we how do we fan those flames correctly? So, and I'm interested in your ideas on this too. But I'll I'll take a swag at it. And I would say yes. I mean, this uh, we have there there are a variety of ways. And and one is the the uh, the you know, the news community, you know, bloggers. There's the press. But you have to. Uh, there's the written word in in, uh, in terms of magazines and, and online news, but you have to go to where the people you're you're trying to influence are. Right? They're not going to read. Uh, congressmen don't read slash dot. Yeah. Congressmen read the front page of the New York Times. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Capitol Hill staffers are you know water and hall attacks, but uh, <laughs> but you, you you put the news where that you know it'll be consumed. You can go you can go more directly. And for those that are interested in the in the hierarchy that is the army, yes, colonel is it's I'm, I'm it's senior enough to be in the room, but you get the back seat in the room. Uh, it's it's the general officers that are really making decisions, but we get a chance. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts. Did I miss any thank key you, point there? Or, uh, I'm curious. Okay, hold on, sir. Uh, thank you for your talk. I was uh, curious about uh, some of the topics here. Uh, some of the things that concern me is the role of the military versus the local government, i.e., you know, who is your customer? You know, a uh, common perception is that uh, the military sometimes is working for the defense contractors or the corporations, and when the military is engaged in local operations, you know, uh, is a citizen their customer? Um, the other thing is that uh, the military, you know, has been really associated with uh, waterboarding and urban assault uh, training. And uh, there is a provision in the military called the Provost General. You know, ostentatiously, uh, you know, at one time it was supposed to protect the Constitution and the enforcement of treaties. And I think that's uh, not happening anymore. And one other suggestion is that maybe um, the military can consider an open house for local citizens to meet the commanders and the soldiers, either on base or off base, as a way for citizens to know who the uh, folks in the field are. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, one one example it was bef I, I was told that uh, the the three largest tourist attractions in New York State were uh, New York City, Niagara Falls, number two, West Point, number three. Um, after after 9/11, they locked the gates, and it's you know largely and it, they shut down basically all tourism significantly for many years. Uh, now it's opening up; you can take a bus in or whatever. But it, again, it didn't help any. Right, everybody went down in lockdown mode. Uh, to, to blur those lines. But I think, you all, sir, you also raised a good point, the idea that this isn't just military, it's law enforcement. 
And uh, I think that some of the things, because we have a special, there's a, uh, I mean, we have access to those communities. I mean, we could come down, talk to the NYPD, and they'll talk to us, and vice versa, right? They've, we've had some people up. So we can have discussions. We have access, kind of we're in that circle, that uh, if we're making progress or have materials to share and maybe start winning over some, some people in those communities, we can um, have some influence there. So uh, I've got some down to how much time? <clears throat> Four minutes, okay. Howdy. Uh, I'm a civil rights lawyer, and I have to occasion, occasionally talk to people at VMI who are just like people at West Point, except they're pissed off they didn't get to work at West Point, and about the Civil War. Our parking is horrible. <clears throat> right. Uh, and so I've got a little bit of experience in trying to articulate these messages. Usually the first thing I open with is I say, you know, your job is to defend civilization. My job is to make a civilization worth defending. So there, there are kind of two halves to this. But the big thing I've found, the big obstacle I've found in trying to get them to grasp civil rights is that they're very procedural. In the military, people are very interested in what did you do or what are you going to do. And civil rights law is not about what you did or didn't do. There's two elements to a civil rights violation, right? There's the motivation for the action, and there's the effect of the action. Motivation and effect. Nowhere in civil rights law does it ask the thing you actually did. And if you look at Jim Crow law, right, the, in the Jim Crow laws, it doesn't matter if you stop someone from voting because of their race, or you stop them from voting because of a literacy test, or you stop them from voting because their grandfather didn't vote in the county. All those things were motivated improperly. They were all motivated because they didn't like the race of the person. And they all had the effect of preventing people from voting based on race. And that, that's a huge hurdle because for people who are trying to, I mean, you, you talk about people saying, well, I, I don't want to do it, or I don't want people to do it because they feel like they have to. Once you get them past the hurdle of understanding, it's not about cleverness. <laughs> it's not about thinking, how do I get around this requirement? How do I get over this requirement? How do I get through this requirement? It's about actually doing the right thing. That's, that's the big transformation. That's when they say, OK, aha, I get it. That's, I, I'm not supposed to try to get behind the rule. I'm supposed to actually be part of the system doing the right thing from the beginning. Good, very good. And I, and I would add that like, we tried, do, not in the, necessarily in the context of privacy, civil liberties, which is something we're all, but in general about ethical decision making on the battlefield. We do, West Point does try and do that, to do the right thing when no one is looking, right? And it's, <laughs> and it, it, so maybe folding it under that would be another uh, way we could, under, under the, because there is actually a great deal of ethics training that goes on for, for leaders. Uh, I'm, so Gus, one more question? Or should I, one more question. Thanks a lot for your talk. Yeah, um, you. I'm sometimes involved in negotiations, and it's a really, like, it might be a really pedestrian comment of mine, I'm not sure, but the first step is finding commonality. Um, and it strikes me that between the two communities, although the means are quite different, the ends are quite similar. I'm thinking particularly about if the military is all about security. Well, so is this community in a way. It's just the security is achieved through technical means. Uh, and if there's one community that knows about finding flaws in security and then patching them up and make it stronger, it's this one. So I'd start by trying to point out that commonality. And I'd also talk about freedom. I mean, as an Australian, I'm constantly uh, amazed at the debate in this country, and it's about freedom. Uh, it's just the means are different. Uh, I would be looking at the military trying to pres preserve freedoms, and here people trying to preserve their individual freedoms, uh, and, and just trying to point, point out those similarities. Uh, Oh, that's actually very insightful. And the idea of just, because I, I, I'm sure if we did some research on negotiation in general, there's other kind of strategies along those lines that could, because in some ways we're doing negotiation, intellectually at least, at least at first. Okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much. Very, very helpful. And uh, cheers. Thank you.